Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, for the record, Bruce's jokes are abysmal, and every time he tweets one, I tell him to stop. Um, so he then proceeds to tweet more. Um, so I'm going to do a, an awful thing called audience participation. Just to, I'm a little bit nervous, so feel free to participate or, or don't go home. It's fine. Um, hands up if you're enjoying the conference. Hands up if you're from Cologne. Hands up if your name is Charlotte. You're extremely anxious. You definitely should have used the bathroom before you started your talk. <laughs> it was a little bit specific. Um, so when Seb asked me to come and do this talk, I was like, easy. I've done it before. I just gave it in Scotland. I've got the slides written. It's going to be fantastic. As my friends know, I don't like to make things easy for myself, though. So I decided in three weeks, I was going to learn German. Because that's easy, right? <laughs> Duolingo says my German fluency is about 16%. Duolingo also tells massive lies. <laughs> to the point where I'm only confident in saying two phrases in German. Ich bin ein kleiner Jung. I'm a small boy. And ich bin eine Kartoffel. I'm a potato. So if you'd like to talk about potatoes or how you're a little boy after the break, come talk to me in German. Else, just don't. <laughs> but I digress, my talk is not about potatoes. Uh, it's about open source. My name is Charlotte. I'm at Charlotte is on Twitter and on the GitHubs. That is me at work. I currently work for Marks and Spencer Digital. I'm learning to be a DevOps at the moment, so I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, but I hear that they don't either, so it's fine. <laughs> I also work as a member of Hoodie.js, an offline first JavaScript framework. I also help bring Node workshops to underrepresented groups in tech, and I am the creator of Your First PR, which I'll get onto a little bit later. I've mentioned the word open source a couple of times, so before I continue, I should probably define what I mean by that. Uh, the cool kids at opensource.org describe open source as software that can be freely used, changed and shared in a modified or unmodified form by anyone. This is a good definition, but it's also, like Duolingo, a massive liar. I do not believe that open source is currently open for everyone. Because um, in order to contribute to open source, you have to have some resources that a lot of people don't have, like the time to contribute the energy to contribute, an internet connection. I think we take it for granted with our high-speed high speed cool internet in our offices, but not everybody has access to that. Little of experience of harassment. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that open source is largely made up of white cisgendered men. Uh, this is a problem. And employment, because if I'm going to spend all my time doing open source, I'm probably going to need some money to be able to eat and buy food and you know have a place to live. Um, but it's not all bad, because my talk is about how we can make open source better. So for the rest of the talk, I'll outline a few ways, I think, small but impactful things that I can do f we can do for our open source projects to make sure that they're a little bit more open, a little bit more friendly, uh, and a little bit more community-oriented. My first is codes of conduct, which hopefully I don't have to explain what it is, because everybody's come into their ven this venue and have agreed to the code of conduct, but if you don't know what it is, it's kind of a set of guidelines that outline what is and isn't acceptable behavior in your project. Um, some large programming communities, which I will not name, do not like codes of conduct. You may have seen various controversies. They're very boring to read um, because they're like, well, what about my free speech, man? Uh, which I understand. I'm a big believer in free speech. But if your free speech is coming into my conference and calling me a butthead, um, you can take that free speech elsewhere. But a code of conduct is not a catch-all. Uh, it's rather a pledge by maintainers to protect, to the best of their ability, their community and their contributors by association. Um, some good code of conducts are the Contributor Covenant by Coral and Ada and the Conf Code of Conduct by Remy Sharp. They're both open source, which means that you can contribute if you feel like they're missing anything. They're regularly updated. Um, so I would say get a code of conduct, but before you get a code of conduct, before you go, yeah, Charlotte, you were amazing. I listened to your talk and it was fantastic. Here's a beer. Um, read it first. You need to know what you're signing up for. You can't just copy and paste something from the internet unless you're writing an essay um, and, and, and drop that into your repository because you need to know what you're signing up for. Uh, similarly, 
keep it updated. As both of these code of conducts are open source, they get regular updates, really important things, and they're improved all the time. So it's important to keep abreast of, of the issues. Um, and the most important thing about having a code of conduct is that you need to learn how to deal with problematic behavior. This is a very difficult task. Um, but having a code of conduct that you're not prepared to enforce is way more harmful than having uh, no kind of conduct at all. For an example of a really good enforcement policy, uh, I'm an admin of a new JavaScript Slack community. Sign up, it's great. Um, and there are a few key things that I think we often overlook when we're talking about code of conduct. Firstly, we all mess up. A code of conduct is not a zero tolerance. You say, you call me a butthead once and you're out. You take every issue as it comes, you deal with them individually. It's, we all mess up. I, I, I call people buttheads all the time and I know I shouldn't, but I can't help it because if they are, you know. Um, <laughs> secondly, the safety of the hurt takes the priority of the person who did the harming. That's just it. Uh, and lastly, a code of conduct means we promise support. It does not mean that you're not going to encounter something bad in a project. It just means that if you were to encounter something bad, I will do my best as a human to make sure it doesn't happen again or give you the support that you need to, to overcome it. If you want to know more about code of conduct, uh, Ash Dryden has written a fantastic 101 and an FAQ. It has lots of resources. It goes lots of detail. Um, so listen to them rather than me. My second topic is a readme. Readme is the first thing that someone sees when they come to your open source project and it's possibly your only opportunity to entice people to actually read and join in with your project. Uh, and currently it might look a little bit like this. So this is unicorn.js, install node, npm install unicorn, ride your unicorn into the sunset. We can provide a lot more detail here in a way that will encourage people to contribute to your project and use your project and remain after they've used it for the first time. So my ideal readme looks a bit like this. Uh, welcome to Unicorn.js, home of the NPM module that will allow you to ride a beautiful unicorn off into the sunset. Any engagement with this project should follow a code of conduct, so here's a link to that. Uh, and then we get onto the installation process. You need Node.js, you need NPM package manager, which doesn't make sense, it's an acronym. Um, and once you've kind of gotten over that first Hello World tutorial, if you'd like to go further with unicorns, here are some books or some videos or some blog posts on how to best utilize your unicorn. Next up, if you get stuck, here's where you go for help. Slack, Gitter, IRC, Discus, Pigeon, Snail Mail, Smoke Signals, whatever it is that you need, it will say it here. Uh, and if your problem is really bad, file an issue. Here's how to file an issue. And as a note for maintainers, getting your issues, uh, providing a template of how to produce issues will help you triage hundreds of issues at one time because they all kind of look the same, so it's easy to go through. Uh, and second to that, how to file a security issue. Um, it's really good to tell people this so they don't end up making you the next heart bleed. Uh, Things that you want help on as well, you are an open source project, which means that you, you, know, you probably don't pay people to work for you, which means that people can decide tomorrow that they don't want to work for you anymore. Um, so you're going to continuously need to entice new contributors. So list some things that you want help on. You know, I want to ship the 4x4 all-terrain unicorn. Here's where you can get started. Uh, and lastly, if none of that covers what you need, here's a direct way that we can get in touch with you. And this is especially poignant for things like code of conduct violations, because I'm hardly going to file an issue that someone called me a butthead in an open format. Uh, next up is a topic very close to my heart, um, is GitHub issues. So as I mentioned at the start, I am a, the creator of Your First PR, which is just a glorified Twitter account um, that posts GitHub issues that I believe to be approachable and accessible for someone new to open source or new to programming or just new to my project. Uh, because I believe that open source is a fantastic, great, uh, a fantastic place to learn. Um, it is the two year anniversary of me teaching myself programming. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and uh, I did that because I went straight to Hoodie and I said, look, what can I do? And I found something to do and then I became part of the community. It was very welcoming and they helped me to learn JavaScript. So the goal is to post readable 
issues on the Your First PR Twitter account, but what constitutes a good issue? Here is one I made earlier on J January the 23rd. Um, the first word you see in the title is accessibility, so you know the subject matter. Uh, then provide the solution rather than the problem. Uh, give the hoodie logo meaningful alternative text because that gives me an idea of what I need to do already before going into the issue. Um, I then provide a little bit more detail so people using screen readers may not understand the context of the logo on the home page because it just reads link slash. Um, more seasoned users of screen readers will understand that slash means home page, but you know, it's better to be explicit than not. And then I provide step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix the issue. And because I wanted someone who'd never even possibly used GitHub before, I provided exact changes in the Jekyll templates that you'd use and the commit message so you can follow our semantic release conventions. Um, really important to make good use of labeling. They're there for a reason, particularly when you, you know, you're a very large open source project like Node.js or Rust. Um, labels allow you to really drill down to the things that you want to triage that day or the topic that you're looking for. The first label is the bright red bug label, which is generally conventional as far as I've seen across GitHub projects. The bugs are also easier to fix, or they appear to be easier to fix than doing a fully fledged feature. Uh, the next label is help wanted because if you're a large project, lots of people are going to open issues and your project says, it broke, please fix it. And that's not particularly useful. So as a maintainer, you can label things that you're actually actively seeking help on. Uh, and the last one is starter, because I use that across all the issues I write to say, OK, if this is your first experience possibly in programming or open source or with this project, here's a really good place to get a little bit of mentorship and, and learn how it works. Whew. So in order to write a good code of conduct, write a good readme, and uh, write good GitHub issues, we need to think about the words that we're using. Language is extremely hard. Programming is way easier, but we need to talk about it. Uh, it the most important thing is to word your language clearly. Um, I think I personally take it for granted that not everybody can, you know, understands as many words as I do, or they might not understand a particular te technical concept. So the Government Digital Service, gov.uk uh, in the UK, recommends that we write for an audience of about nine years old, because that will cater for all different reading levels. Um, to do this, I use an app called Hemingway, which is how I wrote this talk, because I'm extremely verbose, as you may be able to tell right now, and I use lots of adjectives and stuff. Um, so it just tells me when I'm kind of going wrong and to, to bring it back and make it simpler. Um, and my favorite topic is gendered language. So a lot of programming examples I see in day-to-day, -day, particularly in books and blog posts, is uh, they kind of assume that the audience I is a man. Um, and I don't really think that we should, you know, not everyone's a he or a him, so I, I opt not to use those pronouns. Uh, a lot of people decided to kind of fight back and use she and her, which, you know, balances out a bit more. But if you're a magical unicorn like me who doesn't have time for gender, I use uh, they and them as my pronouns. And this is a really good way of just being a little bit more neutral because the, the moment we start to assume things about our audience is the moment we start to pigeonhole ourselves and, and, and only look for specific experiences and opinions. And it, makes, it starts to make our open source project far less open. So, cons uh, and similarly, uh, Try not to use the term, hey guys. I know that that's kind of a controversial thing because a lot of people are like, well, guys, it's gender neutral. To some people it is, but to a lot of people it isn't. So try things like, hey everybody, it's easy. Or if you're talking to a small group of people, just use their name if you know it. Um, but language is hard, programming is easy. So you can use programming to help you with your language. So in the hoodie Slack, we have programmed our Slack bot to kind of give us a gentle nudge when we use language that's considered in uninclusive. So if I say, hey guys, it becomes a communist and asks me if I meant comrades. Um, and if I was to use something like, that JavaScript framework's so crazy, it would say, do you mean like weird or strange or fantastic or amazing? Um, it's really helped us to do a much better job of, of, of using inclusive language. Um, surprise, I don't find uh, programming a particularly important part of open source because 
it's not easy, but it would be, it's easy for me to write uh, a unicorn module and just release it as version one. I'm done. I don't need to do any more. But how are people going to find out about your programming project? Who writes your newsletters, designs your unicorn logos? Who moderates your community on Slack or IRC or Gitter? And who makes sure that your documentation is inclusive and friendly and actually does what it needs to do? I believe that these are extremely overlooked aspects of open source, and they actually provide, in my opinion, more value than the code itself, because it gets people involved, it shows people what your project's about. Um, so recognizing that at Hoodie, we created the editorial team, um, which very quickly became the most important part of the Hoodie framework. They they are amazing. Uh, they take control of everything that you know, kind of really isn't programming related. And it's not just for people who uh, can't program a lot. Most of our contributors are programmers, but sometimes I don't want to program when I've done a nine to five. Um, so I can curate awesome content and good tweets instead via um, the editorial team. So if you'd like to join, uh, that link there is the thing to do. Lastly, if you hated everything I said, which is fine, I won't cry that much, um, the most important part of open source is you. And I'm going to point at randoms. Um, you are the most important part of open source, because without you, open source wouldn't exist, right? The unicorns wouldn't get ridden. Um, and I think I've been burnt out uh, about three times now, each time more magical than the last, because um, I never learn. And uh, I realized that open source is kind of always going to be there. If I take a few days off, I sud people aren't suddenly going to hate my project. They're not going to leave. Um, so burnout is real. So I recommend taking more naps, eating good food, drinking good beer, uh, following Bruce on Twitter if you hate, I mean, love jokes. Um, bad jokes. Um, so just take care of yourself is kind of the moral of this story. Like everything I've said, it doesn't really matter because my idea of open source is this. Um, we are cute little animals sitting around a campfire, optional hoodies, <laughs> roasting marshmallows, being super cool, and, and the, pr the code doesn't really matter in this situation because we're, we have a diversity of opinions, a diversity of experiences, really cool bears, and, you know, there's the most important part of open source. So take care of yourselves. And they're all talking about how amazing their code is because they had the inclusive and loving community around them. Um, that is it from me. I speak fast. I apologize. If you didn't pay attention to anything I said, which does happen, the first link is the link to uh, a long form blog post that I wrote about this. The second link is the link to my slides. Um, and thank you.